And so with that, I'd like to turn the meeting over to our esteemed board member, Stuart Denenberg. And hi, Beverly. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Well, we really are uh, privileged to have with us one of the uh, two of the leading experts in photography in the United States. And Robert Johnson will kick it off with a kind of general, uh, an overview of daguerreotypes. He was a collector, is a collector of daguerreotypes. He was a curator for decades, 30 plus years, perhaps 40 years, uh, at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco in charge of the Achenbach Foundation, the great graphic arts collection, and um, indeed was able to acquire for the Fine Arts Museums a, uh, a Ruskin watercolor, which uh, he'll hold up to the camera for us. And Peter Potter has uh, been a student of photography since a young man and learned all the techniques um, early on and we'll discuss the discovery of the daguerreotypes of Ruskin, uh, as well as uh, his own work uh, and his connection to the Roycroft Society, uh, which is a direct spinoff of the great arts and crafts um, motives of John Ruskin. So why don't we uh, begin, Robert, uh, just uh, with this uh, general introduction to the daguerreotype and uh, your thoughts about our evening. Yes, good. Thank you so much, Stuart. I appreciate being here this evening and talking about Ruskin, talking about uh, the daguerreotype medium. Um, I first would like to tell you that one of the one of my first introductions to Ruskin was when I came to San Francisco in the mid 1970s, and I realized that we had a very important uh, Turner watercolor in our collection that was uh, once owned by Ruskin and caused Ruskin a great faux pas early in his uh, career. He had been invited to a, uh, to a dinner which Turner, his hero, artistic hero was present. And after dinner, as was very often the case with certain artists, they would bring along a portfolio and uh, with drawings or watercolors in them and show them to the, uh, to the assembled, the, the people that came to the dinner that evening. And at that, after that particular dinner, Turner got out his portfolio, showed these watercolors to the, to the group. And Ruskin seized on this particular watercolor, which was of Kenilworth Castle, and said how wonderful it was and what a terrific watercolor it was. And Turner took it the completely wrong way and saying, well, yeah, but what about the rest of the ones? You know, you, you know you're, the implication was this was good, but the other ones weren't good. So he did not get the re reception of his enthusiasm for that Kenilworth Castle that he thought that it, that that time as a young man. Uh, the good news is he later was able to acquire that particular watercolor and the uh, the museum, the Achenbach, uh, was gifted it many years ago. So we have this major, major world-class turn of watercolor in the collection. Uh, 40, uh, 42, 43 years ago, when I was a young curator at the museum, I went into the uh, Fine Arts Society in London and was able to acquire this particular watercolor of Scotland done around 1845. And uh, there we go, great, thank you. And it is, uh, if you notice in the, in, the, in the foreground, there's a geological specimen. So uh, it has two of three uh, of Ruskin's favorite subjects, a landscape, topography, a geological specimen. The only thing it doesn't have is architecture in there, but it's got two out of three. And it was an absolutely fabulous work. Um, of course, this was in 1978, so it wasn't as expensive as it might be today. And uh, we were able to acquire it for the collection. In terms of, in terms of the daguerreotype, uh, I was lucky enough to have a, a gallery in San Francisco called uh, Thackeray and Robertson Gallery, which was uh, down on uh, Union Street in San Francisco. And Sean Thackeray, who now is a great maker of wine, but in those days, in the 70s, he was a terrific photo dealer, especially in the 19th century. And he had a great love of daguerreotypes. And so he was somebody that, that basically taught me about the aesthetics of daguerreotype. And later uh, in the 80s, I actually did a show called The Power of Light, which was an exhibition on uh, the art of the daguerreotype from a local collection, Robert Shimshak. And um, the daguerreotype is, is a, you know, it's both a technologically fascinating uh, medium, 
Uh, but also it had this very, very short life, only from around 1839-40 to around 1850 or so. So it had a very, very short life, uh, but it had the power of a well-made daguerreotype, which of course is a unique photograph, which you'll be hearing about later, but it's a unique photograph. There is no negative. So if you, if you were a, a gentleman who had three grandchildren, you want to make a daguerreotype for each of them, you had to sit for three daguerreotypes. You couldn't sit for one photograph and then have a negative print more. So a uh, daguerreotype is a kind of one-to-one -one medium. And uh, I love the phrase that Oliver Wendell Holmes once said what a daguerreotype is. He said it was a mirror with a memory because actually the daguerreotype surface is a piece of polished uh, polished silver, a polished copper with silver on it that, that, that then has the chemicals applied to it to, to create uh, a, a surface that will retain, retain the image. So the idea of the, the mirror with a memory. And one of the things that, that's also interesting about it is that subsequent mediums such as the amber type, uh, the tin type, and then of course later the paper negative, they all have their qualities. But when you see uh, real daguerreotypes beautifully made, and I have to say, it's interesting that the greatest daguerreotypes, the greatest technical daguerreotypes were in fact made in America. For some reason, they were able to either with their lenses or the polishing of the plates get, get, get a higher resolution. But, but when a daguerreotype is well made, it's like a little hologram to the past. It, it is just absolutely kind of extraordinary. Uh, in terms of Ruskin's connection, of course, I'm going to leave that to Mr. Uh, Potter to be talking about that. But I should just touch a base on, on who Ruskin was in the sense that Ruskin was less an artist than an observer. But even more than that, when you think of Ruskin, you think of him being a writer, a historian, an artist, a social crusader, a geologist, an, archit an architectural archaeologist, and then lastly, a photographer. And, and I should say, from my point of view, I think there's still a certain amount of, uh, of conjecture of whether uh, Ruskin actually took and actually developed these daguerreotypes or whether he worked with others who worked at his direction. But to my mind, or to, or, historically, it really doesn't matter. The fact is that the vision of this extraordinary group of daguerreotypes that we knew existed somewhere that only turned up, I think, like in the last 10 years or eight years and very, very recently turned up in England to the credit of uh, my friend, uh, Kenny Jacobson, who, who found them, bought them. Uh, they're clearly Ruskin's vision. There, there's no interceder. Th th those are Ruskin's images. Th those, are, those are the images that Ruskin needed. And in a way, I was thinking about them the other day and I was thinking that they're basically the visual equivalent of a tape recorder for Ruskin. They were his way to retain visually that which he could, couldn't do on the spot. He couldn't do the, all those extensive drawings he did over the years. Uh, and, and, uh, and he just couldn't do, do them on the spot. And he didn't want to go back to, to England uh, with just memories in his head. And this new invention that came along um, was, was a godsend to, to Ruskin's uh, methodology. Um, which then brings us to Mr. Potter. He is a photographer. I am not. I'm a curator. But I'm fascinated to hear him tell us about the nature of the daguerreotype and how this interacted with Ruskin's vision as a person who delineated, who preserved, and who was an advocate for the uh, preservation and the restoration of Venice in the 19th century. So without further ado, Mr. Peter Potter to talk about the daguerreotypes of John Ruskin. So how do Thank we- you. Good. Thank you, Robert, Gabriel, yes. Stewart, and Eric. So nice to join you today. I'm gonna to get my screen share up here. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I had a sign out. So I, I need to uh, have the host to allow me to uh, screen share again. Here we go. I, I still hey. am unable to share my screen. We can see you. We can see you. I know, but I can't share my slideshow. Okay.
Maybe I should back out. Have you been made host so you can share? Well, I was signed in as host, but then um, I lost my connection. And when I connected back up, I'm not, I'm not a host again. So I need to have host level security clearance. Not yet. So while that's happening, um, I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. And um, I've been in East Aurora, I, I live in East Aurora, New York, which is a town in Western New York. It's about uh, 25 miles away from, to the Southeast of Buffalo, New York, near, near Lake Erie. And it's the home of Albert Hubbard and the home of the Rycroft campus, which is, uh, established by Albert Hubbard, and it's an arts and crafts community that established in 1895 after visiting um, Count Scott Press and uh, Coniston Waters. And he wanted to create an arts and crafts community. And here we go. So I'll be able to start my program, and I apologize for the uh, difficulties. All right, so I started at the Roycroft um, in 1976. It's about a block and a half away from where I live right now. And uh, I started there washing dishes. And uh, since that time, I've become a Roycrofter at large, ma master artisan in the discipline of photography. I'm a doc docent on the Roycroft campus. And uh, without further ado, I'll get started with the program. It's truly an honor to be with you here today. I look forward to the time when I can visit in person. But I'm grateful for this adaptation, which allows for this hand clasp across the continent. Welcome Ruskin scholars and students and fellow artists, thank you for finding the time to join us today. In our time together, I hope to share with you some favorite images and some interesting characters. John Ruskin looking relaxed and content. This is an engraving by Francis Hall in 1857 after a painting by George Richmond. Of Ruskin's numerous artistic gifts, photography is likely the least known. John Ruskin was quick to embrace the fledgling photographic technology. This, this thought seems to defy his very being. In 1835, Ruskin first visited Venice with his parents. He would return 10 times. And on his 1845 trip, he purchased some daguerreotypes from a photographer identified as the Frenchman. Ruskin was, a ver was very enthusiastic about the new technology. The daguerreotype process had only become widely available about three years prior. Ruskin purchased a quarter, type, quarter plate daguerreotype camera and returned to Venice to document ar architectural details. He made daguerreotypes with his valets, John Hobbs and Frederick Crawley, and with professional photographers Fortunato Lasagna, and the Cavalier Hilaire, also known as the Frenchman. Now a quarter plate daguerreotype, and Robert can correct me if I'm wrong, is about um, three and a quarter by four and a half inches. That's the size of the plate that would be produced from, the ca from that camera. This is by the Frenchman. It's St. Mark's in the Piazza in Venice. And it's a quarter plate daguerreotype 
from 1845. This quotes from uh, John Ruskin's letter to his father on October 7th, 1845. I have been lucky enough to get from a poor Frenchman here, said to be in distress, some most beautiful, though small daguerreotypes of the palaces I have been trying to draw. And certainly daguerreotypes taken by this vivid sunlight are glorious things. It is very near the same as carrying off the palace itself. Every chip of stone and stain is there. And of course, there's no mistake about the proportions. I am very much delighted with these and I'm going to have some more made of pet bits. It is a noble invention, say what they will of it. And anyone who has worked and blundered and stammered as I have for four days and then sees the thing he has been trying to do so long in vain, done perfectly and faultlessly in half a minute, won't abuse it afterward. This is John Ruskin's drawing of Casa Doro in 1845. Ruskin used his daguerreotypes as an important resource for the stones of Venice. He felt the need to document the architectural treasures of the city before they were lost forever to careless and destructive restoration efforts. Ruskin felt precious time would be saved with the use of the daguerreotype camera, allowing him to capture more photographs of the structures before they were ruined. The urgency he felt is evidence in this from a letter he wrote to his father on September 23rd, 1845. What an unhappy day I spent yesterday before the Casadoro, vainly attempting to draw it while the workmen were hammering it down before my face. I'm gonna go back. So it's very much the same. Oh, I'm sorry. John Ruskin's drawing. John Ruskin and John Hobbes, Venice, the Ducal Palace, Southeast Angle. And uh, Noah's Vine detail, circa 1849 to 1852, quarter plate daguerreotypes. So he's captured this little detail, he and his valet have photographed it and uh, really done a great job of capturing the detail and the, the tones and the great hue and tones captured in that daguerreotype and uh, you can see the shading and so forth and the beautiful carving. John Ruskin circa 1845 to 1852, St. Mark's, Venice. In a letter home, October 15th, 1845, Ruskin wrote more in praise of the daguerreotype. Among all the mechanical poison that this terrible 19th century has poured upon men, it has given us at any rate one antidote, the daguerreotype. It's a most blessed invention, that's what it is. Ruskin would hold contradictory stances on photographs through time. Photographic, Ken, photographic historian Ken Jacobson writes, he was often instantly and deeply drawn to them aesthetically and emotionally, berating himself for not being able to do as well with his brush. But inevitably, his more spiritual self would later reject them because he deemed them to be created by a machine. In Modern Painters 4, Ruskin criticized the technical shortcomings of the media, especially in underexposed shadows and overexposed highlight areas. Quoting, photography either exaggerates shadows or loses detail in the lights, and in many ways, misses certain of the subtleties of natural effect, which are often the things that Turner has chiefly aimed at, while it renders subtleties of form which no human hand could achieve. John Ruskin in his study at Brantwood, painted by his acolyte, W.G. Collingwood. Collingwood describes the details. Quoting, 
In the window are some of his own books in the Ruskin purple calf bindings, grass of Parnassus in a tumbler of water, and a box of early daguerreotypes of Dennis, of Venice. What would become of those daguerreotypes is quite a story. And point out, there's the glass, there is the uh, grass of Parnassus, and there are the books in the purple calf bindings. And here, sort of obscured by the cat's chair and the curtain, is a red box. You can just see the corner right here. And there's sort of a brass handle that we see right there. After Ruskin's death in 1900, despite instructions in his will for its upkeep, Brantwood on Coniston Water suffered from neglect and deferred maintenance. On a rainy day in July of 1931, the dispersal of the contents took place at the estate. Among them was lot 134. The listing in the catalog described it, mahogany case with brass handles containing a large quantity of photographic plates. That lot sold for six shillings. <laughs> so this is um, from auctioneers, farmers in Kent, farmers in Kid, and it happened to be called lot 132. In 2006, the photographic historians, Ken and Jenny Jacobsons, bought an unassuming lot at an auction in Penrith, Cumbria. It was listed as a mahogany box with an ivory tag marked Vienna, containing 19th century photographs of buildings and stonework. They felt the lot was of particular significance, and it turns out they were correct. The lot included 188 daguerreotypes of Venice, Tuscany, and Chamonix, purchased, commissioned, or made by John Ruskin between 1849 and 1855 as he wrote The Stones of Venice. The book and its contents disappeared after the auction at Brentwood on that rainy day in 1931. It's difficult to overstate the import of the find. So there's a little tag that says, well, we know it to say Venice, but um, it was miscatalogued as saying Vienna. And there's the brass handle. And we saw about this much of the box in Collingwood's painting, and it was actually situated right at the same angle and uh, looked to be just about the same color. It's great to see that. Ken and Jenny Jacobson wrote a book about their experience called Carrying Off the Palaces. It is a robust work of scholarship and an invaluable resource for students of photography and John Ruskin. The book catalogs all of Ruskin's photographs. Lot 132 more than doubled the number of known Ruskin photographs, and it contains the earliest known photos of the Alps. Their book details the preservation and restoration efforts of their fantastic find and discusses where the images were created and puts them into context with Ruskin's watercolors and drawing of the same subjects. It was winner of Apollo Book Award 2015, Book of the Year, and the Ruskin Society Book Prize. Documentary photog photography came into its own in the United States in the mid 19th century. This man was photographed aboard the USS Montauk in front of the gun turret. I'd like to call your attention to the exceptional sharpness and beautiful tonal range of this image. The exposure was made on a plate of glass coated with a light sensitive emulsion. The plate had to be coated, exposed and developed before the emulsion dried. The photographer had to take the darkroom nearby whenever he was taking photographs.
Also aboard the USS Montauk that day was the body of John Wilkes Booth and several other conspirators involved in the events connected to the assassination of President Lincoln. They were awaiting trial. The subject of this photograph is Lewis Payne, also known as Lewis Powell, who was to be convicted of the attempted assassination of William H. Seward, Secretary of State. The subject of this photo sat perfectly still for approximately 15 seconds during exposure. Not even a hair moved. The only thing that betrays any movement is Payne's eyelid. Alexander Gardner was the photographer. I, I just find this photograph very compelling. Matthew B. Brady. Brady was the best known of Civil War photographers. He learned the daguerreotype photography from the inventor of the telegraph, Samuel F. B. Morse. He worked with Alexander Gardner, George Bernard, and Timothy O. Sullivan. Timothy O. Sullivan was known for his work with Matthew Brady and went on to document the West. He was also attached to a survey team of the Isthmus of Panama in 1870. The large size of the camera pictured gives an idea of the prints that were made by contact printing the glass negatives. The image that I'm sharing here is one half of a stereograph. So this is an example of one of the very, very first at the very dawn of art photography. And it's by Henry Peach Robinson. He was a pioneer in fine art photography. Henry Peach Robinson was influenced by the aesthetic views of John Ruskin and the pre-Raphaelites. In his correspondence, he also cites the influence of J.M.W. Turner. This photograph is called Fading Away and it's from 1858, and it was his most popular image. Robinson combined five negatives to create this intimate photograph of a family tragedy. It was jarring for a number of reasons. The theme of the subject matter was considered invasive by Victorian mores, and the artifice of the composite image was visually upsetting. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, purchased a print of Fading Away and was an enthusiastic collector of his other work. Robinson argued forcefully for promoting photography as a fine art. In 1868, he wrote the influential essay, Pictorial Effect in Photography, and also being hints on composition and chiaroscuro for photographers. He resigned from a leadership position of the Royal Photo Photographic Society to become one of the charter members of the Link Ring Society, Linked Ring Society to pursue artistic freedom. This is called Ricking the Reeds by Dr. Peter Henry Emerson. It's a platinum print, 1880, 1886. Born in Cuba, Peter Henry Emerson documented agrarian and coastal life in East Anglia. In 1889, he published Naturalistic Photography for Students of the Art. In this book, he advocated for photography as a fine art and that photographers look to nature for inspiration. He introduced the comp compositional device of selective focus. He railed against composite photography composite photography as practiced by Henry Peach Robbins. He was to inspire Alfred Stieglitz and the photo secessionists and the photo pictorialists. So we can see here, you know, the, the, the focus of this is right in here. And then as we trail off into the distance, the background just sort of fades away in focus as opposed to as opposed to uh, the pr previous print by uh, Henry Peach Robinson, which everything is in uh, stark, fo stark focus. 
This is my photograph from May of 2017. It's the Ruskin Room at the Roy, what is now the Roycroft Inn in East Aurora, New York. I topped a tower addition to the original print shop. The Ruskin Room has served as a workspace for illumining books and office and guest accommodations throughout the years. Albert Hubbard visited England in 1894, and he was inspired by the thriving arts and crafts movement and visited the homes of many authors, philosophers, poets, and artists, most notably Ruskin's Brantwood on Coniston Water. William Wordsworth grave, 11 miles from Brantwood at St. Oswald's in Grasmere, and William Morris's Kelmscott Press. This man is, the man with the wheelbarrow is named Alibaba. His picture is called Alibaba at the print shop. And it was by Francis Benjamin Johnston from 1898. And this tower at the back, uh, that's where the that's where the uh, Ruskin room was housed. And this building here looks a little bit like a church, but it is where uh, Albert Hubbard started his printing press. This is um, Frances Benjamin Johnston, Johnston herself. And uh, the photograph is called New Woman. It's a self-portrait. And uh, she's, she's rather a radical. She's having a cigarette there and she's got a pint of uh, beer, a stein of beer, and it looks like a uh, little bit of her petticoats are showing. So he's, she doesn't really, uh, she's quite a radical. Frances Benjamin Johnston was a pioneering, elect, a pioneering photojournalist. She was given her first camera by George Eastman and was taught photo chemistry and darkroom techniques by George Smiley, the director of photography for the Smithsonian Institution. She had a studio in Washington, DC and took portraits of many prominent Americans, among them Susan B. Anthony, Mark Twain, Booker T. Washington, and she photographed Alice Roosevelt in her wedding gown. She was the White House photographer for Presidents Harrison, Cleveland, McKinley, Teddy Roosevelt, and Taft. Francis Benjamin Johnston would document the South, particularly, particularly rural, coastal, and agrarian scenes. She advocated for and mentored women working in photography. This is my photograph of the lounge at the Roycroft Inn, which was um, originally the print shop. This is where the, um, the, the printing was actually done in the basement of this building. And then this room was used for collating and binding. The lounge is located in what was originally the first print shop. It's Gothic arched windows and timber frame interior. The print shop uh, recalls St. Oswald's in Grasmere. This is the door of, in the salon of the Roycroft Inn. My photograph from August, 2020. In the background, you can see uh, parts of a mural that uh, are panoramic around this whole room uh, by the painter, Alex Fournier. Ruskin's quote, fine art is that in which the hand, the head and the heart of a man go together is distilled to three words in this carving. Albert Hubbard embraced the philosophy and endeavored to make a workplace that had afforded the artisans dignity and honored their work. The Rycroft shops became a place where workers were encouraged to expand their skills and were mentored. They were given 45 minutes each day to learn to play a musical instrument. They were allowed to work on a uh, learning other crafts and skills, and to advance within their own departments. 
men and women received equal pay. This is a map of my little town, East Aurora, New York, from 1909. The Roycroft was growing at the corner of South Grove and Main Street. And I'm going to take a look here, I'll point that out. So here's Main, whoops. Sorry, here's Main Street. And this is South Grove. Here's where, the, this is the new print shop. This is what's called the chapel. All on the Roycroft campus. The Roycroft Inn is right here. And this is where the powerhouse would eventually be built. So all this area here is the Roycroft campus. And it, it's located right at this intersection. It's, um, the architecture is largely um, half timber and wattle, and it looks um, Tudor. This is the door to the Roycroft Chapel. And it's, a, it's not a religious chapel. It's more the thought that it's a um, guild house for printers. And the chapel was built in 1899. It's my photograph from October 13th, 2020. And it's inscribed uh, with the following quotation. Life without industry is guilt and industry without art is brutality. And many following along today will recognize that from John, Rusker, John Ruskin's third lecture on art from 1870. So Albert Hubbard's Roycroft was not only at the corner of Maine and South Grove, it was also situated at the junction of industry and art. Here's a photograph of Albert Hubbard and by an unknown photographer from around 1907. He was a gregarious and persuasive salesman and his quirky homespun philosophy spoke to people. He was a dynamic speaker and his lectures were a hot ticket. Most important for the success of the Roycroft, however, were the skills that he learned at the Larkin Company. It was a soap company that he worked at before building the Roycroft. He, worked, he learned at the Roycroft Company, recruiting, guiding, and ma managing a rapidly growing workforce. This is the north door of the second print shop, my photograph from September 16th, 2016. This motto by the Scottish writer Thomas Carlyle embodies the goal Hubbard had for the Roycroft shops. Blessed is that man who has found his work. He called his photo print shop renaissance. It's from December of 2014. With the chapel at the left, and this double R mark is the Roycroft Renaissance mark of the Roycrofters at large, the second print shop, and the shipping department. Prospective artists who apply to become Roycroft Renaissance artisans present four pieces of work to a jury of master artisans. That work is judged on five criteria, high quality hand craftsmanship, excellence of design, originality of expression, professional recognition, and artistic growth. If the prospective artist meets the criteria, they may use the mark on their original work. Artisans must read jury each year. The cross at the top of the mark symbolizes the tree of life with the branches on the left pointing to our history and those on the right pointing to our future. 
the back-to-back -back R's stand for Roycroft Renaissance. And their tales are rooted in Ruskin's and Hubbard's arts and crafts traditions. The circle represents eternity divided in three parts, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. This is the philanthropy, East Aurora, New York by Leighton Elton Hoffman, June, 1907. In this picture are Albert Hubbard, Alice Hubbard, Miriam Hubbard, their daughter, author Catherine Yates, Jules Maurice Gaspard, Alex, Alexis Jean Fournier, Sadakichi Hartman, and Lillian Bonham are the only ones I can identify. We recognize this now as the door to the lounge at the Roycroft Inn. It was originally the print shop, and upon completion of the second print shop in 1901, this came to be called the philanthropy. It was a term adopted from the French utopian philosopher Charles Fourier, and, Har and Hubbard said it, had, it was a meeting place of friends. Here, visitors, artists, craftsmen, and laborers and writers would dine communally. Quoting, Jules Maurice Gaspard was a prince of a fine gentleman. There was none of the tousled or frowsy about him, and his ethics and philosophy were as fine as he was fine. Author Felix Shea in Albert Hubbard of East Aurora. Gaspard was dubbed Fra Gaspardino by Hubbard, and he was foreman of the print shop. He was an accomplished portrait painter, illustrator, printer, and engraver. He was also a writer and art critic. He was known to fellow Roycrofters as Gus. Gaspard provided many of the frontispiece portraits for the Little Journeys series of books. He also taught illustration and portraiture at the Roycroft School of Arts with Alexis Jean Fournier. Alex Fournier was a landscape painter in the Barbizon School. His tenure at the Roycroft was long and earned him the title of Roycroft Court Painter. He had established himself as a leading impressionist painter in Minneapolis before coming to East Aurora. He is considered to be one of the most prolific and influential painters of the arts and crafts era. Sade Carl Sadakichi Hartman, 1898, portrait by Zaida Ben Yusuf. He was born in the Nagasaki prefecture to Carl Herman Hartman and Osada Hartman. His mother died shortly after his birth and he was taken to Germany with his brother to be raised by their grandmother. While his father pursued business and other interests abroad, he came to the United States when he was 11 to stay with his uncle and immersed himself in studying art, literature, and entertainment. Sadakichi had a photographic memory. By the time he was 17, Sadakichi had become inspired by the poet Walt Whitman and sought him out as a mentor. He visited Whitman and would work for him and would come to work for him as a translator for some foreign correspondence. Sadakichi could read, write, and speak English, French, and German, but not Japanese, which was his mother's tongue. The two men would remain close until Whitman's death in 1892. Sadakichi Hartman is thought to have written the first haikus in the English language. He cited his elder friend as a major influence and inspiration. Quoting, Walt Whitman, I do not call thee master, but I am bound to thee forever. Thy works were to me, except love and nature, the grandest lessons of my life. In 1885, 
Hartmann left for Germany to explore its art galleries and museums. He studied art and literature in Munich, Berlin, Brussels, and Paris, and worked as a stage apprentice at the Royal Theater in Munich. He used this time to study all aspects of the theater, as well as ballet. He wrote well, he wrote a well-received biography of the painter James Whistler, and also found work writing art and dance critiques for periodicals. Sadakichi was well served by his great memory, deep knowledge, deep knowledge of art and command of the English language. He tried his hand at theatrical production with an avant-garde multimedia presentation that featured slide projection, music, motion picture clips, and fragrances. For some reason, it was not commercially successful. Sadakichi was known for his wild improvisational dances. He would dance even in his later years according to a witness at a Hollywood party in the 1930s. He danced like a graceful whirling dervish. Isadora Duncan was said to have been influenced by his dancing. He envisioned composers creating pieces of electromagnetic music whose vibrations do not simulate orchestral instruments but open up horizonless vistas of pure sound, which seems to have foretold a synthesizer. It's just a beautiful portrait. And uh, I've got another photograph by, by uh, Zaida Ben Yusuf. And it's a portrait of Albert Hubbard uh, by, as I said, Zaida Ben Yusuf. And she was a, um, she was, a, well, it was a woman, not that I would know that Zaida is a woman's name, but um, Hubbard, some, <laughs> for some, and I love this photograph. Also, it shares the same sort of tonal quality and beauty as, as the uh, previous um, photograph of Sadakichi. But um, she gifted this, yeah, I mean, Hubbard gifted this photograph to uh, uh, Francis Benjamin Johnston, who did some work at the Roycroft that we looked at earlier. Um, but I don't think Hubbard ever met a photographer he didn't like. Around 1906, Sadakichi Hartman came to East Aurora to do some writing for Albert Hubbard. He moved into this house on South Grove across from Hamlin Park with the, Roy with the Roycroft artist, Lillian Bonham. Together, they had five children. He had also had six with a first wife and an additional child with another woman. Roycrofters George and Gladys Scheidel Mandel fondly recalled him in an interview with director of the George Eastman Museum, Tony Bannon. They said he would be seen swooping around the campus in a great cape. With little urging from Alibaba, he would leap upon a table in the inn and perform dances. The great photographer Edward Weston claimed he was the best interpretive dancer he had ever seen. He was a colorful and highly influential journalist and critic and attracted great photographers to the Roycroft campus. Sadakichi Hartman was one of the earliest writers to recognize photography as an art form. He's associated himself with Alfred Stieglitz to write articles and essays in the early photographic journals, Camera Notes and Camera Work. He wrote nearly 700 known published articles on the subject of photography, often using pseudonyms usually as Sidney Allen, occasionally as Caliban, when he would poke fun at his mentor, Alfred Stieglitz. A collection of his selected essays and profiles of photographers is found in the book called The Valiant Knights of Daguerre. The journal Camera Work was a result of a rift of the, in the Camera Club of New York. Alfred Stieglitz, editor of Camera Notes, wanted to feature articles about photography as an expressive medium, while most of the membership of the Camera Club of New York preferred focus on photography as a documentary craft. Alfred Stieglitz created camera work and was free to pursue fine art content. 
Sadakichi left East Aurora in 1917. He was crowned King of the Bohemians in Greenwich Village by Guido Bruno. And he had an appearance in the 1924 Frederick, I mean, Douglas Fairbanks film, The Thief of Baghdad, as the court magician. The portrait of Sadakichi by the painter Ben Berlin, 1934. Oh, to be Sadakichi. Oh, to squeeze every moment out of life and release some of the water from that overflowing well of ideas incessantly needing to be expressed. Ezra Pound. It's very much a uh, denizen of the modern age. This is called, this is a composition called The Floating Rose, the photographer's Clara Ciprell. And Clara Ciprell exhibited her first photos with the Buffalo Camera Club in 1910. Although it was close to women at the time, but because her brother, was a member, she was allowed to participate in the exhibition. She won second prize for one of her portraits. Although she couldn't become a member, she was able to continue exhibiting in the annual shows. And in 1913, she won six prizes, surpassing any of the club's rostered mem members. And I just, I just love this photograph. It uh, just, everything is right about it. I love the, uh, use of light and dark, the very soft focus, except for just the subject itself, and just the luminous quality of, of the light coming through that water as it's bounced off of that wall. There's some really appealing uh, leading lines that draw you in. And uh, it's just a great contrast of light and dark, soft focus and sharpness, water and glass. I love her work. Here's a number, another one of her photographs called Still Life with Figurine from 1920, Clara Ciprell. Uh, Sadakichi Hartman took notice of Clara's peach, pieces at the show and wrote two favorable reviews of her work. Her success is prompted an invitation by Sadakichi to speak at various photography clubs in New York City. She moved there in 1915 and opened up her own photography studio in Greenwich Village. So again, you know, the brightest, just, just great, you know, Charles Scuro here, you know, just a hint of the background, another couple of nice sort of hinted diagonal lines here. Um, very sensuous sculpture here, but the brightest thing and, you know, glowing mysteriously from a faraway light is this uh, globe of water again and with these beautiful little flowers in it. This young man is Paul Fournier and this is a self-portrait from 1905. And Paul was the son of that great painter, Alex Fournier. He was a, he was a, a photo pictorialist. And uh, we can see uh, Paul's iconic Roy Crofter tie here, this big floppy tie. And perhaps uh, this is one of the columns at the end of the Roy Croft campus perimeter wall that would be at the corner at that intersection of South Grove and Main Street in the village of East Aurora. Alfred Stiglitz, photographed by Edward Steichen, 1915 at Gallery 291. The little galleries of the photo succession at 291 Fifth Avenue in New York City was created and managed by Alfred Stiglitz. The gallery was crucial in getting photography acknowledgement as a fine art by exhibiting the work of photographers, including Edward Steichen, Alvin Langdon Coburn, Gertrude Casabier, 
F. Holland Day, and Clarence H. White. The photo secession was formed to establish photography as a fine art, upending the traditional belief that it was a documentary craft. The prevailing aesthetic of the photo secession was called photo pictorialism. Fred Holland Day, self-portrait, December 31st, 1910. In 1900, F. Holland Day organized the New School of American Photography. Oh, well. Yes. It was the first exhibition of American pictorialist photography in Europe. It was held in London and Paris, and the show featured his own photographs, as well as works by Edward Steichen, Gertrude Kasebier, and Clarence White. Alfred Stiglitz included Day's photographs and writings in the early journal camera notes, but he was never able to persuade him to become an official member of the photo secession. This is Mrs. Cora Brown from 1897, F. Holland Day, a platinum print. These platinum prints have just such beautiful tonal range also and uh, just beautiful. And you can see, I mean, uh, the, the composition is beautiful, the photograph is beautiful, and it certainly recalls that burnt Vermeer painting. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, F. Holland Day was looking to uh, emulate a, a sort of paint, painter uh, style in this photograph. This is Cahill Gibran by F. Holland Day. Um, F. Holland Day actually mentored Gibran as a young man. It's a platinum print from 1897. Edward Steichen, self-portrait, 1903. Edward Jean Steichen was a modernist, painter, photographer, and museum curator at Museum of Modern Art. Although the chiaroscuro and evident brush strokes suggest a painting, there is a result of the gum bichromate printing process. Steichen advanced the photo secessionist cause through photographs like this, as well as exhibitions and the publication camera work that resulted from his collaboration with close friend Alfred Stiglitz. Steichen's photographs frequently appeared in camera work during its publication from 1903 to 1917. With his colleague Steiglitz, Steichen opened the little galleries of the photo secession, which eventually became known as 291, its street number, in 1905. Steichen and Stiglitz promoted photographers and other modern artists while apprising artists of the latest developments in early 20th century European modernism, including the works of Auguste Rodin, Pablo Picasso, Constantin Brancusi, and Francis Picabia, Picabia. So you can actually see the brush strokes and the pigment is actually fixed onto a gum bichromate print with like a stenciling brush. Uh, the, the, when the print is developed, um, there's hardly any contrast on it at all, but um, the pigment is worked into it with a brush, and that's where you get this, uh, these great brush strokes. And no doubt, no doubt here of uh, the photographer's intent in emulating painting. This is a photograph entitled Aurora, 1916, and it's by Wilbur Herber Porterfield, and it's a local scene, but I don't know where it was taken. Porterfield gained an international reputation for his style of photography that often portrayed Western, the Western New York landscape. His photographs regularly appeared in the Sunday Rotogravure insert in the Courier Express in a popular feature called As Porterfield Sees It. Wilbur H. Porterfield was the founder of the photo pictorialists of Buffalo, 
as with the linked ring in England and the photo secessionists of New York City, their goal was to elevate photography as a fine art. The members explored the technical, thematic, and aesthetic boundaries of the photographic medium. The photo secessionists and the photo pictorialists of Buffalo faced a challenge overcoming public perceptions of photography. By the earliest 20th century, Photographs had been used for documentation for almost 50 years. Photography was burdened by what Anthony Bannon called in his essay, The Photo Pictorialists of Buffalo, the albatross of fact. I love that phrase. The Photo Pictorialists of Buffalo earned international acclaim. Venice Canal Scene, circa 1908, by Charlotte Spaulding Albright. Charlotte Spaulding studied photography with Edward Steichen and became a member of the famous Photo Secession, a group of American photographers led by Alfred Stieglitz. Charlotte Spaulding was born in Buffalo and married Langdon Albright, son of J.J. Albright, who was benefactor of the Albright Gallery. Albright Art Gallery. This is just a dreamy, dreamy scene and I, I just love it. Every time I look at it, I'm, I'm more and more drawn to it. At first, I, I didn't like its indistinct appearance, but uh, it just draws you in. The, the leading lines make you want to go down that canal and uh, just the tones and the subtle shading just really cap captivate me. I think she learned her uh, lessons well. This is a photograph of Charlotte Spaulding herself, Charlotte Spaulding Albright, by Odwood Steichen in 1907. And it's just as dreamy as can be. And um, the process is just fascinating. I've never actually seen one of these in, in person. Um, it's called an autochrome. And what we're actually looking at is a glass transparency. And it's made with an additive color process. And the process was uh, invented by the Lumiere brothers who were instrumental in uh, the cinema, the uh, development of cinema. The process was invented in 1903 and uh, Steichen was an earlier adopt early adopter of the process. And he certainly found the right subject and the right uh, colors, the daffodils and the background just fantastic. Uh, here's, a, here's a photograph called Water Lily, uh, not dated. Um, the photographer was Augustus Jackson Thibodeau. And uh, uh, he, he was a local attorney. Attorney Augustus Jackson Thibodeau was another of the founders of the photo pictorialists of Buffalo. And his friends included Sadakichi Hartman, Alfred Stieglitz, and Max Weber, the painter. Just another dreamy scene, that uh, lotus blossom just sort of floating along there. This catalog was published on the occasion of the International Exhibition of Pictorial Photography, which was on view at the Albright Art Gallery from November 3rd to December 1st. 1910. The initial development of the 1910 International Exhibit of Pictorial Photography began after the enthusiastic reception of an exhibition of local photographers, the photo pictorialists of Buffalo, which closed at the Albright Art Gallery on October 2nd, 1907. The following spring, Dr. Charles M. Kurtz, the first director of the Albright Art Gallery, visited Stiglitz and Steichen at the little galleries of the photo succession. Their intention was to discuss another exhibition, one of international scale. And Kurtz requested the aid of both the photographers, of both the photo pictorialists of Buffalo and the photo succession in organizing the exhibition. The exhibition was brilliantly installed by the painter Max Weber who transformed the most beautiful gallery in America, as Stiglitz once called the museum, 
into an intimate space for the viewing and understanding of contemporary photography. In total, Stiglitz's Buffalo Show introduced the museum's audience to more than 600 photographs by 65 artists. It is generally recognized as the first international exhibition of fine art photography. We'll have a look at three images from that Albright Gal Art Gallery International Exhibition of Pictorial Photographers, starting with uh, Still Life by Heinrich Kuhn. He was a German photograph from 1908, a gum by chromate print, image size six and three quarters by nine. And again, you can see that gum by, by chromate uh, technique with the brush strokes swooping in there and depositing that pigment and uh, great light play on the, uh, on the round forms. This is a photograph by Alfred Stiglitz, The Street, Fifth Avenue, 1896. It's actually a photogravure. The image area is 12 by nine and one eighth inches. Um, weather was often a uh, rain, snow, or uh, fog. Stiglitz often pictured that in his um, pictures from his pictorial um, era and uh, features strongly in giving a great atmospheric look to the, to the uh, photograph. This is by James Craig Annan. He was Scottish and it's entitled Lombardy Plowing Team from 1894. It's a carbon print and the image size is four and a half inches by 10 and a half inches. I thank you for your attention tonight, this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed the images I've shared and found the characters in my story interesting. I will close with one of my new photographs from Biltmore House in Asheville, North Carolina. I call it the Logia. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. I have a question. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about when I see all those buildings at Roycroft? you have this feeling that somebody had some money there. there was, 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 he, was he a wealthy man or did he have wealthy supporters? That's a great question. Um, Hubbard worked for the, um, he started out selling soap as a teenager and uh, he came to Buffalo and he, he worked for something that became the Larkin Soap Company. And soap was a, uh, a revolutionary product at the time. Um, You'll know from the Gamble House out in uh, Pasadena, uh, the fortunes that were made at the early part of the century uh, just by selling soap uh, because it freed the uh, household of having to make soap out of uh, what lard and uh, ashes. So the, the soap business was exploding. Hubbard was a great salesman and he, he worked at the Larkin Company uh, from sale, root salesman he became vice president and uh, he decided at the age of uh, 36 that he wanted to quit the soap business. So he sold out the, of the soap business and he, for about $75,000, which in 1892 is when he sold out. So he had $75,000. So he went into, then he went to Europe. He, he visited uh, his uh, inspiration from uh, Ruskin and uh, Morris. And he came back to the United States and he built a printing press. He, he loved what Morris was doing, uh, printing, and he loved uh, Ruskin's message. So, so he came back to build a press. And uh, he had that little print shop that, you, that I showed in the first building, in the first place there. And uh, in 1899, he printed a, printed a little story. He, he was... Uh, he had a little pamphlet that he put out and it was called uh, 
the Philistine. But, uh, and this was an, another publication, another publication that he did called Little Journeys. And, uh, oh yeah, here's one of those uh, frontispieces pieces by Gaspard. Mm -hmm. But, um, so you talk about those places that he visited in uh, England and he'd write about them, but he also had a pamphlet called The Philistine. In March of 1899, he wrote a story about the Spanish-American War and it was called, um, well, it didn't even have a title, but it was a story of duty and uh, self-reliance. And that story resonated so much with people that, that uh, it was called for to be reprinted. Eventually it was reprinted, I don't know, something like 16 million times, 40 million times. You hear, a, you know, I mean, the, the Roycroft scholars can't even tell you, but uh, just that 1500 word pamphlet uh, printed in like a four by five brochure is what financed the building of, of um, 14 buildings on this whole campus. And uh, he just plowed all that money back into the business. He was a great speaker. He spoke in every town in the country just about. And uh, everybody wanted to see him speak. He wrote a lot of books. He had a lot of people writing for him under his name. He sold a lot of advertisement and, and he just grew his business until he had 500 people working for him. He was a uh, he was a capitalist like crazy, but he took great care of his workers. He, he wasn't the best paying worker. I mean, he wasn't the best paying employer in the area, but uh, everybody wanted to work for him because uh, he really honored their work and he really gave them a way to move forward. It seems when you think of him, there's like four words that come to mind, uh, industry, inspiration, craftsmanship, and beauty. Those, are, those seem to be the four legs of, this, of the uh, table of what he was about. The, the, you have that sense of industry, but you have a sense of craftsmanship and beauty are like crucial to the method because I have some of the little Roycroft pamphlets myself and they are so exquisitely put together, both design, typography, uh, the whole thing is, is a, has, a, has a unity about the expression. He, uh... He certainly was, and uh, you know, he got the best graphic designers he could um, for a time. W. W. Denslow was his graphic designer. W. W. Denslow uh, is known for uh, a number of things, but uh, producing the work of uh, uh, the Wizard of uh, the books, the Oz books, the Wizard of Oz. He did the original artwork for first editions of those, and uh, then then later, Dard Hunter took the uh, took a hold of the whole design scheme of the Roycroft product line, which was uh, hammered copper and uh, stained glass, uh, book bindery, um, and, 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 the, and the graphic design. And he actually, um, and he evolved, uh, Dart Hunter did, he evolved from uh, sort of a Gothic look in the graphic design to uh, um, he, he came to uh, Europe and studied the Viennese secession while he was working returned and he came back with that more austere Viennese secession look. So yeah, uh, I mean, but craftsmanship, yeah, he certainly honored that. He made, he made the furniture in the uh, mission style, very austere, a lot of quarter sawn white oak, uh, fumed white oak. It was the uh, furniture that they built and uh, they, they built that stuff to furnish the inn. And the inn was built because people were coming to East Aurora because they wanted to meet Albert Hubbard and hear his lectures as he spoke here in East Aurora. So everything sort of evolved, uh, you know, it's like, okay, how, you know, what do we do now? There's, there's people here, they wanna, they wanna talk to Hubbard. So, okay, we'll have a lecture. Okay, now they want to eat. Okay, we'll have a restaurant. So just uh, everything grew so quickly. But um, while he worked at the Larkin Soap Company, that business was growing very quickly. So he, he realized he needed to manage that and get ahead of it. So that was his industry. And he cultivated uh, great craftsmen to work for him. And uh, he had the craftsmen, uh, well, he had the artists mentor, the artisans, he had the artisans mentor the craftsmen, and he had the craftsmen's 
mentoring the laborers. So uh, he had a progression of throughout the uh, business to, to, to maintain that growth. He was a great manager of, of labor. Um, Peter, it is wonderful. The photography was just out of this world. And I just, are you, uh, are you in East Aurora now? Yes, I live in East Aurora. Okay, because uh, both Hugh and I are from Buffalo. Oh, really? And I'm totally fascinated by this. So this, the, the Roycroft still exists there? The Roycroft, you know, I, I've, I've lived in East Aurora um, all my life thus far. Oh. And uh, uh, the Roycroft has never looked better. Uh, well, yeah. next time we can go to Buffalo. I've still got relatives there. You, you, come, there. you come and give me a shot. I'll give you a tour of the campus. Yeah, I love it. I really would. Yeah. And I'm a photographer as well. And uh, congratulations on your photography. It's beautiful. Thank you. I wanted to know if you're working in digital or, or not. I am, yes. I do a lot of uh, um, post-processing editing. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I gave this talk um, earlier this fall. And uh, one, of, one of my uh, Roycroft master artisans was along on that talk. And she asked, she asked me, did I, did I ever do anything with that gum bichromate process? And uh, I'm very fascinated by it and I'm studying it and uh, I'm going to start using it because there's a great way that you can, uh, you can produce a large negative with, with uh, digital processing. Yes. And then you can uh, contact print that uh, with the photo, with the uh, bichromate process. And so I'm very excited about trying that. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Make beautiful prints. Yeah. And super, super um, permanent. Uh, they, they will last forever. You can leave them in the sunlight and they oh. won't fade. Amazing. Good she point. just mentioned talking about, uh, talking about permanence. You, you showed that beautiful autochrome by, by Steichen. Yes. And they are very beautiful. They, as a curator, I have to also point out, however, they are extremely delicate. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot put them on, on display. When you see them in museums, they're usually reproductions. They were put into light boxes because they need back lighting. Yeah. And usually when you see them in an exhibition, they're not the original, they're, they're, back, they're backlit reproductions because they're just very, very fugitive and too much light will completely fade them out and uh, destroy them. Yeah, I, I, I knew that they were very uh, ephemeral. Absolutely. Yep. Peter, I've got a comment. I'd like to, uh, you gave a wonderful talk as always. And as always, I learn a lot from looking at your wonderful selection of, of images. Um, so one of the things I think that you have done in this talk, which I found very, very enlightening and uplifting was that you showed a progression of essentially uh, what Ruskin would have regarded as um, as photography as a record of the way things were into an art form. I thought your pictures did that very, very nicely. So I want to ask you a little bit more about that. So uh, certainly I would have recognized photography as an art form or an evolving art form. So my question really is that as, as the time went on in the, in the 20th century, how did photography evolve into an accepted art form as opposed to simply a recording process, which I think is what Ruskin really thought of it as initially, and then, and then it changed, not really in his lifetime, but not long after he died. Yeah, not long after he died. I think it was evolving, you know, right near the end of his life. And it was by uh, those pioneers, those uh, photo pictorialists and the uh, the, the ring in England and the uh, photo secessionists. And, uh, you know, I think of uh, Stieglitz and Steichen as, as the thought leaders in that whole process. And they just advocated for it. Uh, the, the writer critic, uh, that crazy dancer, uh, Sadakichi, um, he, he did a great deal to further it and uh, fix it as a, as a true art form. So. I think both the, you know, and, and Ruskin's work as, a, as an art critic, you know, so, so much of that is, uh, you know, we, we <laughs> when our work gets criticized, we love to hate the art critic, but I think um, 
the art critic also helps define the the uh, the medium, and I think that's uh, I think that's why I spent so much time on and why I'm so fascinated by Sadakichi because I think um, he's one of the prime writers that helped advance the uh, the uh, craft to an art form. I, hope that... uh, I, I think of uh, Hubbard's uh, really adoration of Ruskin's phrase, fine art, you, you cited it, fine art it happens when head, hand, and heart come together. Um, and I think his reservations about photography early on was that we photography was great. I mean, you could have head and you could have, could have heart, but it would be very hard to have hand in the process. So those early pictures you showed of St. Mark's in the 1850s, let's say they're very beautiful and they give us a record of what it looked like back then. However, it's a, it's a snapshot, so to speak. It, there's not much hand in the issue. Is, is so uh, if you could comment uh, about the issue of uh, hand in photography. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, as a digital photographer who had to uh, defend his work uh, as head, hand, and heart uh, to become a, a Roycroft artisan, uh, I will say that uh, there is hand, and here's where that comes in. Uh, in, the, in the composition, in the iterations that you make uh, in the editing process, and in the uh, just where you position yourself and how you configure that photograph. That's, that's how I uh, find that to be. How you configure the camera, whether you uh, whether you are looking for a shallow depth of field to uh, selectively focus and highlight one thing, or whether you're looking for a, a composition that has a, a, a greater uh, depth of field and include more in the uh, subject matter. Well, Cartier Bresson referred to it as the decisive moment. Uh, you know the nature. The nature of, of, of photography is that uh, is that it gives you limitless possibilities to click the shutter. But the great photographers know when to click the shutter, and as you said, at what angle, at what time of day, at what exposure, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea that the camera is just simply this mechanism, and one then demeans the result from the uh, from the person who uses it is uh, really beside the point because the great photographers take great photographs over and over and over again because they put all of those decision making that you talked about uh, you know to 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 use just as you know when Cezanne said when I put my my brush to canvas I've made my like fifth decision the medium the height the width the viewpoint the viewpoint, you know, so all of those different things go into the painter, but all of those things also go into the photographer, just as you outlined. And uh, this idea that there's a mechanical, uh, uh, a mechanical uh, uh, device that you use is really beside the point. The point is, you know, how 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 the uh, the image is made. And as you said, there's a there's a tremendous amount of hand involved in photography if you really think about it. Agreed. And another, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, the camera's just another tool. It's just like a chisel or a Absolutely. paintbrush. No question. How, how do you see the, uh, the, the future of photography uh, given uh, the uh, digital revolution and the, the future of art photography? It seems like it's much more difficult now uh, because of the, the relationship of the photographic image to the real. And in a certain way, we now live in a hyper real world where uh, the real is kind of hidden behind the image. And it, I, it seems that the, for a photographer, an art photographer now, uh, it's a tremendous challenge it's not like the uh, heyday of, of uh, art photography uh, 40, 50 years ago, or uh, no, in the 40s and 30s, uh, where you were trying to capture the you know scenes from 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 life in a very 
uh, perceptive and and and, and uh, uh, personal view. Uh, but now it, it seems like it's 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 much more difficult because of the transformations so that have that have taken place uh, in uh, our our the combination the, the the bringing together of the individual consciousness and the you know the social uh, technical uh, reality of today's world. So how do you see the art photography? photography as, as going forward? I think we're going to see, um, you know, more straight up digital artists, for want of a better thing, you know, people that are creating out of whole cloth uh, digital scenes, and uh, they will sort of diverge from photographers and uh, so there, there will be that distinction. Um, I, I, that's just in my head, just because, yeah, yeah. If, just because I'm not good at that good at that kind of Photoshop. So, if, if I, I may I, make a comment, I think that what the digital age of photography has done, it has democratized photography and made it available to a num many, many people who would never have been able to afford um, a camera, let alone paper and chemicals, etc. And we're finding extraordinary things coming out in the realm of photography in places like Latin America. And uh, the inventiveness of imagery and uh, with now the whole um, technical apparatus and Photoshop and um, manipulating manipulation of images is, is just un, unheard of and unprecedented. So I think it's just a new age if you want from um, using a medium of capturing light if you want to create an image. And I don't think there's really any difference at all. Um, it's just um, a difference in the material that's being used, the equipment. One thing I would say, though, that's fascinating is that uh, having taught at the San Francisco Art Institute for many years is that a lot of young photographers, just like some young people, are now collecting LP records. Mm -hmm. LP records are like cool for some of these young people that, you know, they're buying a record player and buying LP records. So they, they're, they're rejecting some of the new technologies and some very, very, te very technically and very artistically innovative artists are making photographs in collodion and daguerreotype mm -hmm. and ambrotype and using some of these some of these mediums and as we refer to the you know the gum bichromite but gum bichromite is not an easy medium to use but certain artists are taking that up so just as some artists and there's a great democratization as I will agree with you in digital photography some of these younger artists just seeing the inherent qualities of a daguerreotype of a tintype, of an ambrotype, of a gun by chromat, and are taking very beautiful avant-garde images in these old mediums. These old mediums have a certain quality about them that can't be reproduced in a digital camera or even with a negative. And so they're, you know, or, or the traditional negative. And so it's fascinating that uh, the great thing is that photography 50 years ago, there was an article like 45 years ago on Newsweek said, is photography art? That was an open question 50 years ago, and that has been fully, fully answered, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. but, but the nature of the democratization means that people are going in both directions. They're not only looking forward technologically, they're looking backwards too, which I think is really, really interesting. Yeah. And, uh, Absolutely, you know, and I think the same is true in all the visual arts. Well, it's true in music too. I'm a, I'm a composer and, and uh, the, the, the new uh, discovery of, the, uh, of, of vinyl if you listen to vinyl records, you, you, you hear the fullness of, a, a fullness of sound that you don't have in a, a, a digital record that's made up of ones and zeros that representing, giving you a representation of the sound. You hear the, the full spectrum of sound in a, in a, on a vinyl record. And it's much, it's quite astonishing. And, you know, everything old is new again. Also, uh, 
you know, on, on the democratization that Daryl was talking about, there, there was, um, you know, when the Kodak camera came out, that was, you know, I can't think, but, you know, early, early part of the 20th century, the Kodak camera became, yeah, uh, in, the, in the aughts, it was certainly developed in the aughts and available and uh, just everybody started taking pictures. Actually, it was like in the 1890s, you, you would get a camera with film in it and after you took the pictures, you didn't send the film to the right. Kodak company. You sent the whole camera to the Kodak company. They'd remove the film, develop the film, and send you back the film, the pictures, and the camera, and a new roll of film in the camera. So you actually they actually sent the camera to the right. factory. Right, and and so anybody anybody could do it. Absolutely. Uh, pr prior to that, it, it was you know just gentlemen that were of means and that understood chemistry and science and that, uh, you know, so, so anybody could do it back to that. And uh, one of the and, dirty little secrets of the history of photography is you know why there are so many important women photographers of the late 19th century and way through the 20th century is because being a photographer or having a camera was not was not a challenge to the boys club of sculpture and painting. And so, so the Gertrude Casebeers and, and Julia Margaret Camerons didn't seem to produce, pr produce a, a threat to the male painters and sculptors and stuff. And so when you look at the, uh, at the history of photography, there's a, a much larger percentage of good photographers of the last hundred years that were women or 150 years because, because photography was seen as, as kind of a side craft. And so it wasn't that challenge to the male painting and sculpture establishment. And so the women that had some means, as you said, had money and had an had a aesthetic interest were able to, uh, to utilize the medium. And that's why there's such a large percentage of women in the history of photography. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yep, yep. Does anybody consider that film is as moving pictures the next iteration and beyond that virtual reality which is coming on where we'll invent entire fictional uh, universes uh, and they'll be as subject to uh, creativity as pencil and paper. Yeah I think there'll be uh, virtual worlds that you'll be able to explore sure absolutely. And that's a kind of continuum. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy continuum. Yeah. Well, they are. They already are. If you have any children or grandchildren playing all these games, you know, Grand Theft Auto and all of these war games and everything else, those kids are living in a virtual world right now. They, they quite frankly, spend too much time in it. Myself, is in my opinion, but uh, that for for younger generation, they're, they're deeply into it much more than people over forty. Well, as the Ruskin Art, Art Club Executive Director, and once we get to discussing virtual worlds, uh, it's my unhappy duty to bring this uh, stimulating evening to a close. And unfortunately, as I always do with announcements. So just a couple of brief announcements before we close. Um, before I do the announcements, I'd like to introduce the uh, newest member of our team, uh, Katrina Lau, I think she's still with us. Katrina, Hello. can you? There yeah, you are. I'm still here. <laughs> Terrific. Our new programs management intern who comes to us from the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Uh, she'll be assisting us in the next few months with our program planning and with the ongoing development of our website and other online platforms. And we're so very pleased that she, that she uh, has joined us. Upcoming events, two weeks from tonight, we'll be back on Zoom with another lecture, this time from Ted Bosley, who I think has left us. Um, the executive director and CEO of the Gamble House, speaking of soap fortunes, uh, the Gamble House Conservancy in Pasadena. Ted, a foremost scholar of the arts and crafts movement and the work of architects Green and Green, will speak to us about the influence, the little, uh, little remarked in a way, influence of the historic Swedenborgian church in San Francisco, uh, built in 1895 and involving Bernard Maybeck among others, on the development of the California version of, the art, of arts and crafts. 
Uh, we especially want you to save the date on Thursday, February the 11th, 5 p.m., all these events, uh, when we will host our annual Ruskin birthday bash. Uh, Ruskin's birthday is actually February 8th, but this is the closest we can get to it uh, schedule-wise, schedule and it promises to be a great and fun evening. We'll have a concert uh, from the Zelter Quartet from the Thornton School of Music at USC, who will give us a program of Haydn and Beethoven quartets, along with readings from Ruskin's work read by actresses Joanna Cassidy and Kathy Mazur. The evening will be uh, capped, I might add, by a special musical premiere. We think it very well may be a US premiere. So uh, don't miss this. Uh, please visit our website at www.ruskinartclub.com for more information and details about the upcoming season. Uh, for those of you who have inquired about where you can access past lectures, particularly the 2020 series, uh, we have launched a new YouTube Ruskin Art Club channel. And you will find at least three, currently three of last fall's offerings there uh, at this moment. And we'll be posting more and more all the time. Uh, all you have to do is uh, actually just say Ruskin Art Club on YouTube and it will bring you directly to the Ruskin Art Club channel, and you can also link on the website. This lecture, by the way, was recorded and will also be posted there as well. Our thanks to tonight's presenters, to Peter Potter and to Robert Johnson, and we'll see you all on the 28th. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Good night, everyone. Yeah, good night. Very nice. Very nice. Great to see you, Jim. Good to see you.